is does the holographic principle apply to the sitter space? Uh, here are a few papers that, uh, that uh, address some of the questions that I'll talk about. But the first thing I want to talk about is what I mean by the holographic principle. And what I mean is essentially what the holographic principle first meant. You have a region of space. Uh, a region of space means space cross time and it has a boundary. There's a bulk inside it, a time-like boundary, in fact. This is a bulk inside it. It's described by all the various things that we describe bulks in terms of gravity, metric, action, Einstein-Hilbert action, Newtonian gravity it contains, contains black holes, Hawking radiation, all the things that we think should exist in the bulk. On the other side of the divide, is the holographic theory, or the hologram, we can call it. Again, time-like spatial boundary, and on that time-like spatial boundary, there's a theory of some sort, which is purely quantum mechanical. It has a Hilbert space, it has unitarity, it has a Hamiltonian, it has things like entanglement, complexity, but it does not have gravity, at least not in its formulation, it doesn't contain gravity. Assumption? Uh, the holographic principle is that the right side can describe everything that's on the left side. Some examples that are very familiar to us, uh, matrix mechanics, matrix theory, which is a pure theory of the uh, quantum mechanics of matrices. On the right-hand side is 11-dimensional supergravity. Conformal field theory, ADS, SYK, JT gravity, and so forth. I wish I could say there were a lot more, but I don't know very many more. Uh, and notice the divide is a sharp divide between what is on one side, gravitational bulk physics, on the other side, uh, pure quantum mechanics. Okay, let me, before I uh, get into what I actually want to talk about, let me just say in one particular uh, situation, one particular type of theory, which is called DSCFT, I want to explain which side of the divide this falls on. Is it a holographic theory? Is it a bulk theory? So let me just remind you very, very quickly, uh, at least this is a uh, description that Juan gave us. We have the sitter space and we make some cutoff at a very late time. Well, it doesn't have to be a very late time, a late time. And we describe the Wheeler-DeWitt wave function on that cutoff surface by a conformal field theory. The partition function of a conformal field theory involving a set of uh, operators A, those could be, we think of those as um, matter fields, a metric on the slice, not a bulk metric, but a metric on the slice that we slice off. And we construct parametrically in terms of the couplet, in terms of the uh, metric GIJ, we construct a Wheeler-DeWitt wave function. If we want to calculate anything from that Wheeler-DeWitt wave function, we have to square it and insert an operator of some sort. And that inevitably means in the end of the day, we'll be doing an integral over G, over the metric. The whole thing will have the look of a Euclidean quantum gravity problem with matter on a space-like D minus one sphere. I want to say, I'm going to say this is not a holographic theory, not in the sense in which I said it. It may be very powerful, extremely useful. Certainly in the hands of one, it was very useful in studying uh, features of inflation. But it is not what I mean. It's at best a hybrid of some kind of boundary theory and some kind of bulk theory. So I will not be speaking about, uh, about this kind of... Um, this kind of theory. What is our best bet for a truly holographic theory of the sitter space? And the only alternative that I know is to have a holographic theory associated with each static patch. Or maybe it's each pair of static patches. So the first question I want to address, uh, one question, is everybody still there? I've had this habit of uh, losing audiences and going on and on talking to myself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
yes, at least some people, I don't mind if everybody leaves their mic open, but at least some people leave their mic open. And every so often when I become insecure, I will say, okay, did you hear that? Please answer me. Okay, first question is where is the hologram? Now, when I say where is the hologram, I mean the same sense as we say the hologram for ADS is on the boundary. Next, what does the theory compute? In other words, what is the theory about? What do we know about the properties of a, of a uh, holographic description of a static patch? And finally, I want to talk about implementing the symmetries. Now, I may not get to all of this. I'll get to as much as I can. The symmetries that I'm talking about, incidentally, are very special symmetries for the sitter space. They take one static patch into another. Here I have, a, this is a picture of two, this is um, not the true Penrose diagram. It's, it's a doubled Penrose diagram, but that's not important. Here's the static patch associated with a particular, I don't know, we can call them a observer. And here's another static patch. And there must be transformations between these. Transformations between different static patches and also transformations which preserve the static patches are the symmetry of the sitter space. We would recognize the sitter space by implementing these particular symmetries. These symmetries are very difficult to implement. No, it's worse than that. They are impossible to implement, but we'll come to it. That's one of the things I wanna talk about. Okay. All static patches are equivalent. That's at least in classical De Sitter space. They have a metric, is the metric. F of R is, I understand this thing called F of R is called an emblackening factor. I didn't know that. The emblackening factor uh, is universal. The parameter R is the Hubble radius, the cosmological radius of the space. And, uh, if we are in a static patch, then what we see is, first of all, the center of the static patch, that's little r equals zero. I'll give that a name, I'll call it the pode. Why I call it the pode? Well, I just like the word pode. The horizon at r equals capital R, that's the boundary out here, and anybody inside uh, the static patch looks out and sees the horizon a kind of inside out version of a black hole. Okay, now let's go to a Penrose diagram, a true Penrose diagram of the same situation. What we find when we draw a Penrose diagram is that static patches come in pairs. They come in pairs, which if our experience with ADS is any guide at all, those two pairs would be expected to be entangled, uh, in, entangled pairs of static patches. One of them I've called the pode, and of course the other one is the antipode. And they just mean the opposite ends of the... Uh, the boundaries of the... The, um, the boundary, the pode and antipode boundary of the diagram are not true, are not true boundaries of the sitter space. They're points. We'll come back to it in a moment. Okay, so what am I going to assume? I'm going to assume or I'm going to try to assume, try to uh, explore the possibility that the holographic description of the static patch or the, of the pair of static patches involves a Hilbert space, which is a left cross right Hilbert space, the left patch and the right patch, that there's a Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian that I'm going to think about is the boost Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian which slides, which not doesn't push everybody upward, but pushes us upward, let us say, on the antipode side and downward on the pode side. And it takes the form of some H right minus H left. Uh, as I said, none of this can I prove. All of this is something I wish to explore. From the look of the diagram, you might expect that the state of the system is the thermal field double, as it would be in the sitter space, as in the, in the eternal black hole of the sitter space. And the temperature, and this is a peculiar feature of the sitter space, it's an uncomfortable feature, I think, that if it did have such a holographic description in terms of a Hamiltonian, 
there is only one allowable temperature. I think what that means is there's only one allowable temperature which in which the symmetries of the sitter space would be manifest or would be true. Okay, the temperature is one over two pi r, r being the Hubble radius, and the Hamiltonian, the boost Hamiltonian, annihilates the thermal field double state. These are all, as I said, assumptions. Let's look at this, this let's look at this uh, Penrose diagram for a moment. Just looking at the Penrose diagram, you couldn't tell. Is this the ADS eternal black hole, or is this the De Sitter space that we're after? The Penrose diagrams are the same. However, the geometries are very different. In particular, a slice through t equals zero here would look completely different. The ADS, the two-sided ADS geometry, uh, would look like a wormhole, which expanded out to infinite boundaries on either side. Whereas the De Sitter space, the same Penrose diagram or the same slice would look like a sphere with the pode at one end and the antipode at the other end. So they're quite different. And to, um, to, to represent that difference, let's add some structure to the, uh, to the uh, Penrose diagram, structure that Busso introduced, which are these wedges. First of all, we can label the sides of the diagram by the radii, by the radii of the spheres at those points. And we see that ADS and DS are essentially exactly the opposite from each other. I'll let you stare at that for a moment. You, you all know a great deal about it. Okay, what are these wedges? These wedges, for our purposes now, the wedges just tell us whether when we move in the direction outward or move from the direction uh, of the point here, that tells us that the local two spheres are expanding as we move out. And as we move along the tail feathers here of the little arrows, the radial, the, the uh, radii of the two spheres decrease. That's all we need to know really about, uh, about the Busso wedges here. And notice that they are exactly the opposite in the ADS two-sided black hole and in the sitter space. Okay, now I want to answer the question, where is the hologram? Where are the degrees of freedom? Where shall we locate them, at least nominally? So let's come first to ADS. And let's take a pair of what Busso would call screens. I'm not sure he'd call them screens, but two surfaces, one over here and one over here. We could work with just one of them. And according to Busso's rule, the entropy found on a segment of a slice here, this pink segment of the slice there, that entropy is bounded by the areas of these, um, of the spheres at the uh, tips of these Busso wedges. Well, that means in this case here that the, uh, that the number of degrees of freedom, the maximum entropy on this slice here if these two points are very close to the horizon, is just barely big enough to describe the entropy of the black hole itself. It is not big enough to describe all the things that could happen out beyond the horizon. What we do, of course, in ADS is move outward. We go outward toward the boundary, put our screens there, and according to Busso's rule, the entropy on the entire slice, or almost the entire slice, is bounded by the areas of the spheres way out here. If we take those points out to the boundary, we have enough entropy or enough degrees of freedom to describe everything on a space-like surface. And that's why we put the ADS uh, hologram at the boundary. But now let's look at the sitter space. Imagine, we put um, our screen over here. And then according to the rule, the rule is that the entropy on this little piece over here, this little pink piece over here, is no bigger than the area of the sphere at that point. But the sphere at that point has a small area. 
It's over here, right over here. The area at that point is small and shrinks as we go to the pod or the antipod. And so by putting a putting our screen out near the pod and the antipod, that's nowhere near big enough to describe all the physics that would happen in the entire um, static patch. Instead, we required to put the screen, oh, I keep doing that, the screen very close to the horizon. If we put the screen very close to the horizon, then according to Busso's rule, there's enough degrees of freedom near the horizon here to account for everything that can happen on the entire uh, static patch. So the lesson, the De Sitter hologram, or at least the hologram describing the static patch of the Sitter space is at the horizon, as opposed to anywhere else. Uh, we can, probably useful to think of it as a stretched horizon slightly away from the actual mathematical horizon and uh, for the usual reasons. Okay, everybody with me? Any questions? Are you gonna discuss uh, back reaction? Back reaction of what? Of the excitations of, of the matter excitations in the space time. I'm just referring to the fact that in ADS, you know, near the boundary, yeah. that becomes arbitrarily small, whereas in the sitter. Yes, yes, that's that's it's, a very big difference. The um, the boundary of ADS is what I would call cold. Uh, it's cold because the energy scales to excite it are so high, whereas the horizon is not cold. Uh, so this is a big difference. And how we are to how what we're to make out of that difference? Well, I'll talk about it a little bit, but I don't claim to fully understand it. In any case, what kind of degrees of freedom, what kind of theory might we place on the horizon? Should it be a quantum field theory? Should it be a quantum field theory whose degrees of freedom are located on the horizon? And the answer I think is no. The reason is that the De Sitter space horizon or the De Sitter space itself is a fast scrambler. I'll remind you what a fast scrambler means is that if you drop an object into the, uh, toward the horizon, that uh, it's degrees of freedom mix up with the entire horizon in a time called the scrambling time. Uh, a fast scrambler is one which scrambles fast and fast means logarithmically fast. All right, so you can do this, you can do this problem uh, in a baby form in the sitter space. For example, you can drop in a charged particle. This was the first attempt, this was long ago. The first attempts at understanding scrambling were in terms of dropping in charged particles and seeing how their charge spreads over the horizon. That was for black holes. We can do exactly the same thing for the sitter space. We can drop a charged particle in, we can solve its field and uh, calculate how the, it's really the normal component of the electric field, which is a substitute for the electric charge, how the electric charge spreads over the horizon. And one finds very much like in a Schwarzschild black hole that the time to spread over the horizon is logarithmic in the entropy or logarithmic in the radius of the horizon. It's a fast scrambler. So the sitter space like a black hole is a fast scrambler and it does not scramble ballistically as it would in a local quantum field theory. That would suggest, well, let me say, uh, yeah, that would suggest uh, that the degrees of freedom are all to all k-local degrees of freedom coupled in a manner, let's say, similar to SYK or something like that. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to, we're going to have to modify that, but this is, let, let me not say that suggests that all to all couplings. Let me just say that all to all couplings are the kind of things which do lead to, uh, to fast scrambling or one of the kinds of things that lead to fast scrambling. So the, uh, the horizon degrees of freedom should definitely not be thought of as a local quantum field theory but more like a highly non-local um, all-to-all coupled system. 
All right, now, uh, just mainly as a foil for talking about things later, I want to introduce a toy model. The toy model isn't a good model. It does not describe decently any kind of anti space, but it's, it's a useful foil for, uh, for discussing the sit space later. First of all, the pod is a point of instability. What I mean by that is that if you had a particle or an object, a galaxy or whatever it happens to be, which was slightly displaced from the pod and you allowed it to evolve, it would eventually fall through the horizon. That means it would move away from the pod and fall through the horizon at a distance R, capital R, away from the pod. Um, once I pick a pod, once I pick a pod, I can then look at the motion of an object relative to that pod. I pick a pod, meaning, what does that mean? That means, really what it means is I pick a point in the remote future and in the remote past and think of the causal patch. I, I didn't really fully define the causal patch. Uh, Raphael, what is, the, what, is the def, what, is, what is the causal patch? Is it the domain of uh, influence of the... Uh... Yeah, so you pick a pair of points, one in the past, one in the future, you construct the static patch associated with them. Having, uh, having uh, constructed it, uh, then there's a natural pod, which sits at the middle of it. And, uh, and anything slightly away from that pod, following geodesic trajectories, will fall through the horizon. And uh, that, uh, that would, I would like to know if we can form a holographic theory of this type. Uh, I would not be terribly disappointed if in the end we find out that there are limitations and that this can at best be an approximation, uh, that it's a scrambler of any kind, yeah. But no, but it, the, the, uh, the motion of that particle relative to the pod is an exponential growth of the, uh, it's a typical exponential growth associated with an instability. And the, the non-relativistic model, which is most like this, would simply be a, an upside down potential, the pole sitting at the top. You know, let me go back a step. If I were to build a simple model of desitters, of anti-desitter space, anti-desitter space, a model that's simple enough that I could explain it to a small child, I would say it's a sort of container with a potential that pulls stuff toward the center, a gravitational field that pulls stuff toward the center. anti, -de anti -de space is the opposite of the sitter space, so the sitter space is the opposite of anti -de space in this respect. It uh, looks like a cavity with a repulsive center and an instability for objects located at the top of the potential here. Anything at the top of the potential, if you displace it a little bit, will fall and will fall down to the minimum. I also want to imagine that there are in non-relativistic particles and these particles have been put in with some energy, some temperature, and that they sit down at the bottom here and uh, form a kind of thermal gas with an entropy of order the number of particles. This region is the horizon. This is the pole. Anything you drop in will fall off and eventually be in the horizon. The horizon degrees of freedom just exist there in boring eternal equilibrium. Very boring, but with occasional interesting Boltzmann fluctuations. By a Boltzmann fluctuation, I mean a large scale fluctuation in which a significant number of degrees of freedom might find themselves up near the pod or someplace else. It doesn't have to be at the pod, but a pod is a complete, uh, is a convenient place to think about. That's about all that can happen. Well, it's not all that can happen, but this is one of the things that in principle can happen. And uh, of course it happens very infrequently, but this is all that happens in a pure desitter space or in a pure model like this occasional fluctuations. And it is my belief that what an ideal desitter space is, is it's, or a theory of an ideal desitter space 
is it's just the theory of these fluctuations. But the fluctuations can be interesting. They're very intermittent. They don't take place very often, but they can be interesting. Uh, sometimes people call them Boltzmann brains. Okay, the questions that I want to address is how do you calculate the probability for these fluctuations? How do you calculate the probability for these fluctuations? And I'm going to give you three formulas for the, for the probability of a fluctuation. One is you calculate the entropy of the system constrained to have the Boltzmann fluctuation present. I'm calling the Boltzmann fluctuation theta. Theta or O, I can't remember, theta. Uh, constrained subject to the condition that the Boltzmann fluctuation is present, calculate the entropy of the system. The difference between that entropy and the entropy of the pure the sitter space or the pure, uh, sorry, the entropy without the Boltzmann fluctuation, that is called delta S. And the probability for the fluctuation is just e to the minus delta S. That's, a, that's one of Boltzmann's formulas. Another formula is that it's e to the minus beta times the energy of the fluctuation. Those two are consistent for, a, uh, for, for an isolated system. And the last formula is let's suppose that we can quantum mechanically construct a projection operator that projects out states in which this theta object is present. Then the trace of rho times pi of theta is the probability that theta is present. All three of these are the same, basically the same formula, where rho is of course just the thermal ensemble. All right, now there is much, this is one thing that you could calculate. How likely is it that, uh, that such a fluctuation exists? There's many other things you could calculate of a more dynamical character. For example, the transition probability that if you start with theta, you end up with theta prime up on the top. Theta prime could exist, could be a slightly different state or it could have uh, an extra particle falling down in or whatever. Can we calculate that transition probability? Well, in principle, yes. If we knew what these projection operators were, this is pi of theta, this is pi of theta prime. Uh, we can time, if we know the Hamiltonian, we can time translate pi of theta prime and we can calculate the trace of rho times the correlation function of pi of theta with pi of theta prime. And that's basically the transition probability to go from here to here. So the point is thermal equilibrium, if you could calculate everything that thermal equilibrium entails, everything possible in thermal equilibrium, there's a lot of stuff there. There's an entire uh, description of evolutions of galaxies, evolution of uh, and um, it's not totally boring. But the time interval between interesting things happening is very long. All right, so calculating delta S, this is a challenge. How to calculate delta S. In the toy model here, you can estimate delta S. Uh, it's basically just the entropy of S itself, of uh, theta itself, is the way to think about it. If a bunch of degrees of freedom separate themselves from the mess down at the horizon here, then the horizon has fewer degrees of freedom. Instead of having n, it has n minus little n, and the entropy of the horizon is diminished by a factor n minus little n. Uh, let's, uh, let's keep it simple. Let's just suppose that the object up here also has entropy of order little n, but much smaller than the coefficient n here. That, that is something that you'd expect. All right, then you'll find that the, uh, that the delta s for creating a fluctuation up here is just of order n, the number of particles that come up here, uh, or the number, or, or just the entropy of the object theta up on the top. 
And it would say the probability of forming such a fluctuation would just be of order e to the minus some constant times the entropy of the system up here. Little s stands for the entropy of the system up here. So keep that in mind that for simple non-relativistic models, delta s would just be proportional roughly of order the entropy of the thing that appeared that we're, uh, that we're searching for up on the top of the, of the pod. In comparing the n here and the n here, I would say this c is less than one. And the reason is simple. The particles that exist up here, if they were found down at the bottom, they would have a fairly large volume to move around in. If they're constrained to be up on the top, they have a smaller volume to move around in. And uh, so the entropy of a group of particles stuck up near the top here would be likely less than the entropy if they were allowed to fall back down into the mush. Okay, this is, this is not terribly important because this is not a good model. Now I want to make that jump and say, let's calculate, let's see if we can calculate using general relativity what delta S is here. Okay, so let's calculate using general relativity what delta S is. And to do that, well, first of all, we start with the metric of the de Sitter space by itself and calculate its, uh, well, its horizon is R equals big R. Its entropy is pi big R squared over G in four dimensions. And, uh, and that's the initial entropy. Now we consider a system theta and let it be a black hole. Let's think of it as a black hole. For simplicity, let's just take it to be a black hole. A black hole sitting at the center at the pode. What is the entropy of the system now, I don't mean the entropy of the black hole. I mean the entropy of the whole system, including the black hole and whatever else happens to the rest of the system. And for that, all we need to do is take the metric of the de Sitter space, including with its black hole. This is, this is all you have to do to get the entropy of the black hole in de Sitter space is to add a Schwarzschild 2mg over R inside the emblackening factor. Then recalculate. Sorry, hold on. Recalculate the area. We can recalculate the area of the horizon. The horizon is defined by setting the emblackening factor equal to zero. We find epsilon here. The decrease in the radius is just mg. And what do we find? We find that the entropy of the system in, that now contains theta this is not the entropy of theta, it's the entropy of the system which contains theta and other stuff it is just pi g times r minus mg squared. And the deviation of the entropy from the original de Sitter entropy is just two pi mr, that's just this product, pi over g, r times mg, that's just two pi m times r, the g's cancel, and uh, that's it. So this is the probability of nucleating or whatever it is, or what do we call it, nucleating a black hole of mass M. Big R here is not the Schwarzschild radius of the, if, if this were the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole, this whole thing would just be the entropy of the black hole. This is not the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole. This is the cosmic radius of the horizon. Okay, so we have succeeded in calculating it. And of course, we can use that to calculate the probability. Now, Boltzmann tells us something else. Boltzmann also tells us that the probability for theta is e to the minus m divided by the temperature. This is just the Boltzmann factor for an object of mass m. And so thermodynamics basically tells us that m over t must be t two pi m r. We knew this anyway, in fact, but, uh, but let me just say it this way, that the consistency of thermodynamics with fluctuations tells us that m over t must be two pi m r, and it tells us the temperature of the de Sitter space. 
I emphasize this because it's a way of thinking about the sitter space um, thermodynamics, which doesn't require us, for example, to change the cosmological constant, which doesn't require us to, uh, to think about variations of things that we may not be able to vary. Instead of thinking about how things respond to changes in cosmological constants and things like that, you think about how energy is partitioned between fluctuations and uh, the rest of the system. And that gives you another form of thermodynamics, which in this case just tells you that the temperature is one over two pi r, and that's correct. So the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole is a kilometer. The radius here that goes into this formula here is uh, 10 to the 10th light years. So the m squared g squared term is entirely neg negligible. And that's the whole point here. The whole point here is that something has given us an answer which involves a much bigger exponent here than you would have gotten by just using the entropy of the black hole itself. Okay, so um, good. Now I want to come to another formula, a distinct formula for delta S for the probability for, um, for nucleating such a thing. Let's start with delta S equals two pi MR. Okay, and let's, ca let's calculate R. First of all, pi R squared over G, that's this formula over here is equal to the, S naught means the entropy of the de Sitter space. Naught simply means the de Sitter space. Pi R squared over G is equal to S naught. So from that, I can, com uh, from that, I can compute R. On the other, the same type of formula over here for the entropy of the black hole, it's four pi M squared G, and that'll tell me what M is over here. I multiply those two together, and here is what you get. You get that the, that, the, um, that the delta S, the thing that goes into the Boltzmann formula and the exponent, is the square root of S naught, that's the Sitter entropy, and the black hole entropy. A curious formula. And I claim that that kind of formula has all kinds of hints in it about what the fundamental, uh, what the holographic degrees of freedom are. Uh, Tom knows this very well, and I'll just repeat the, the story here. I want to compare this formula here, which contains only entropies of the various uh, constituents, the, the horizon, S naught is the original entropy of the horizon, S, little s, is the entropy of the black hole. Let's compare that with the toy model, first of all. The toy model says that the fluctuation or that the delta S in the toy model is just of order little s. The delta s that we compute is much, much bigger than that. So it means that compared with the toy model, it's much, much harder to fluctuate a object of mass m than it would be uh, it's much harder in the de Sitter space, much less probable. And one question is, what is the, what is the reason why it's so much less probable? So I'm gonna describe now a model which uh, was discussed uh, by Banks, Fiol, and... Okay, so how, does, uh, how do these uh, models work? I would call these toy models with strings attached. Instead of just having N non-relativistic particles, we have N, I guess we could call them D0 brains, uh, but they're objects which strings can attach to. Another way of saying is if we're talking about matrix models. Uh, Mij is the string field operator, the creation and annihilation operators that create and annihilate strings connecting I to J. These are familiar things from matrix theory and uh, other, other situations. And uh, we have a degree of freedom like this for every pair of N constituent or N, uh, N, N D0 brains. I'm just representing that by drawing a collection. The black here are the D0 brains and the blue are not necessarily strings, but the blue represent the modes. They represent the matrices MIJ. 
they may or may not be occupied by having strings excited. Uh, typically in thermal equilibrium at a temperature, the kind of temperatures we want to think about, the strings would be excited and so uh, in, the, uh, in the horizon degrees of freedom. And so we would expect a, uh, a big uh, soup of strings in these zero brains with on the average, some number of strings connecting every pair of these zero brains. That's a model, that's a, uh, that, that's a model uh, for the physics here. And the degrees of freedom are these MIJs. And very similar to what we do in matrix theory. How many MIJs are there? There are order n squared of them. And so we would expect that this system in thermal equilibrium above some very low temperature would have an entropy of order n squared. In this case, not n, but n squared. Uh, what would we mean by a Boltzmann fluctuation? Well, in the model, the idea is that a Boltzmann fluctuation is what happens when a group of particles disconnects itself completely from the rest of the horizon degrees of freedom. I won't try to justify that. It seems like a reasonable, and certainly it's the kind of thing one expects from matrix theory. When this disentangles itself and, uh, and disentangling itself, first of all, may say something about entanglement, but I also just mean that the string modes which connect the two lumps here are in their ground state. That's the way we might describe a, uh, a uh, Boltzmann fluctuation. And that Boltzmann fluctuation will have an entropy of order little n squared, little n squared uh, degrees of freedom. Okay, so what's the, what's the difference between the original entropy of the starting horizon and the horizon plus little fluctuation? Well, it contains a term n minus little n. That's the remaining number of the zero brains and the horizon degrees of freedom squared plus order little n squared. In other words, it will be proportional to big N times little n. But big N times little n is nothing but the square root of S naught times S. All right, so another way of thinking about it then is that delta S is simply the cost of freezing the off, by off diagonal, I mean the strings freezing out or saying there are no strings uh, connecting theta with the horizon. In other words, it's the cost, if you like, of just eliminating, cutting them. I don't know, cutting them is not the right way. Constraining them to not be there, the strings not be there. I'll call it the string freezing factor, this, this, uh, this type of factor. And I'll refer to this effect as the string freezing effect. Um, and what it's saying is if you want to reproduce the, uh, the kind of um, entropy for fluctuations in the sitter space, there's something going on which re requires you to cut the connection between the degrees of freedom of the black hole and the, uh, the horizon degrees of freedom. Okay, now somebody, I believe it was Juan, asked me about higher dimensions. So let's see what we can say about higher dimensions. It would be lovely and nice if the story just persisted for higher dimensions. As we'll see, it does not. Okay, to go to higher dimensions, we do the same thing. We take the emblackening factor. Now the emblackening factor is the same for pure de Sitter space, but if there's a mass, this is not M, this is mu over here, where mu is equal to this object. This is a general formula in little d dimensions. Don't worry about it. Don't try to memorize it in the next 10 seconds. You'll fail. Well, I don't know, maybe you won't. And the horizon, of course, is just the place where the emblackening factor is zero. If you work it out again to first order in mu or, or also to first order in the mass of the, uh, of the little black hole, you'll again get something which is big R minus something proportional to the mass. It now contains in various ways big R. Okay. You can use this to calculate the change in the area due to putting in a mass. And again, if you work it out, 
you'll find it's exactly equal to m over t. This much doesn't change. It's exactly the Boltzmann factor in every dimension. That had better be, otherwise we'd be making some bad mistake. Uh, delta S the, uh, of a fluctua of the is equal to the mass over T again. But now I want to express this in terms of the entropies of the two objects again. And so we have to go through a rigmarole. It's not too hard, it's pretty easy. Just use some of the equations uh, that I've already written down. And here's the formula that you get. Delta S, the, uh, the string freezing factor, contains a numerical factor depending on the dimension here, which is not, uh, not, not important for us here. And it contains powers of the, of the entropy of the black hole and the entropy of the, um, of the de Sitter space. For D equals four, if I haven't made a mistake, it goes back to the same formula that we had before. But for large D, as D gets larger and larger, it tends towards something which only depends on small s. Notice the, uh, the exponent for large s goes as one over D, and so large s disappears. And what this means is somehow it's much easier at high dimension to disconnect the, um, the fluctuating degree of freedom from the horizon degrees of freedom. And the answer is very similar to what we had in this uh, early uh, toy model, just something proportional to small s for large dimensions. In other words, another way to say it is the string freezing effect is much weaker for large dimension. In fact, as we get up to very large dimension, it looks like the string freezing factor goes away altogether. And uh, that's a bit puzzling for the following reason. Well, well let's see how we can say this. Um, it looks like the degrees of freedom which connect the fluctuating system to the horizon have become totally unimportant. One might say that, uh, that my, one might worry about that. One might worry that the all-to-all -all coupling required for fast scrambling uh, disappears at large d. That the uh, that the degrees of freedom become not so thoroughly interconnected. And you might worry what happens to fast scrambling under that circumstance. Well. The answer will turn out to be that you don't really need all-to-all -all coupling to have fast scrambling. You need something that I'll call enough to enough to make fast scrambling. And how much is enough? And is it consistent uh, with this kind of formula? And I'm going to construct now a very crazy model which shows that these things are consistent, that you can, that you can let's, let's say we can reproduce this formula here with a system for which we have good reason continues to be a fast scrambler. I'll call it the sparse matrix model. And here's how it's defined. Again, you have a collection of D0 brains. The left diagram here, represents all of the possible modes that were there in the original model. Namely, every D0 brain can be connected to every other D0 brain by any number of strings. The MIG, MIJs are there for all possible pairs of D0 brains. The sparse model is defined as follows. You go through this interaction diagram and you go to each degree of freedom, and you either eliminate it or you don't eliminate it probabilistically. The probability being given in a moment. So you start eliminating. Probabilistically, And what are you going to end up with? 
you're going to end up with a sparse version of the, uh, of the interaction diagram. I will take the probability to not delete. The probability to not delete is some constant divided by n, the number of the zero brains, to a power p. This means that as n gets large, you eliminate a larger and larger fraction of the, um, of the modes. You eliminate them as possible excitations. The number of surviving modes in the end is c times n squared, y n squared, that's the original number that we started with, divided by n to the p. That's the probability to not eliminate is c over n to the p. That's the number of surviving modes that are left after this decimation of the system. What is the entropy? The entropy of the uh, pure de Sitter space, that's just capital N to the two minus P. Yeah, this, this is N to the two minus P. The number of surviving modes is N to the two minus P. We might expect that that's equal to the entropy uh, of these degrees of freedom. What about the theta? What about the small black hole? Well, we do the same thing that we did before. We take, we remove n degrees of, remove little n degrees of freedom from the horizon soup. And we calculate the remaining entropy. And that will be little n minus little, big n minus little n, again, to the two minus p. And we can work that out. And we find that the delta s, the entropy deficit, it's capital N to the two minus P minus one times little n, which we can rewrite in terms of the entropy. Here are the entropies. The entropies are n's raised to powers. And we can rewrite it as S naught to the two minus P minus one. Well, you can read it. I don't need to read it out loud. It looks sort of similar to the formula that we're trying to reproduce. Here's the formula we're trying to reproduce. Again, a little s to a power, a big s to a power. And we can equate these powers. For example, we can equate the power of little s here, that's s to the d minus three over d minus two, to s to the one over two minus p. And that gives us two minus p is equal to d minus two over d minus three. We can do the same thing with big s. And we get another formula. Well, as it turns out, these two formulas are identical. They are not two different formulas. They are the same formula. And they give you the answer that P, this power P in the, uh, in the, in the statistical elimination of modes, it turns out to just be D minus four over D minus three. Not a particularly uh, special number. Notice, that it goes to zero at d equals four. That means that you didn't uh, that you didn't decimate at all. You didn't cut out any of the degrees of freedom, and it goes to one as d goes to infinity. As d goes to infinity, this goes to one. And so we can ask now for different d's, in particular for d equals infinity, where my biggest concern is, where it looks like you've decoupled everything. What does the interaction graph look like? In other words, what are you left over with in terms of a graph when you've, uh, when you've eliminated uh, string modes according to the probabilistic rule involving this D here? Okay, so what are the number of surviving edges after you do this decimation? Well, the number was two to n to the two minus p, it was n squared when, uh, when we didn't do any decimation, n to the two minus p, as d, and as d goes to infinity, that just goes to a constant times n. That's the number of remaining modes. The number, notice that the number of remaining modes did not go to zero as d went to infinity, it went to n. That's proportional to the number of vertices. So that means the interaction diagram has about as many uh, um, edges as it does vertices. Somewhat bigger, but only by a numerical constant. 
The constant C here is called the degree of the graph, and it's simply the number of edges coming out of each vertex on the average. So we have a random graph of average degree 2C. That's, that's the way the graph theory works out. Here's a non-random graph of degree three. The non-random graph of degree three is just a lattice in this case, excuse me, I just lost my picture. Hold on. Uh, it's just a lattice. And if you were to calculate, you know, you, you keep going until you run out of the zero brains. You keep building it until you run out of the zero brains. This is a very non-random graph. And it has a diameter which grows as n to the one half. Diameter means the largest distance between any pair of points. The one half is just because it's in two dimensions. It's a power law in n, the way the diameter of the graph grows. Random graph of fixed degree or fixed average degree is a different kind of graph. They're called expander graphs. So I'll tell you just a little bit about expander graphs. Here's a picture of it, it looks like a cabbage. Here's a picture of an expander graph. The reason I drew it with wiggly lines is it turns out the eye much prefers the wiggly lines when looking at these things. I tried drawing it with straight lines and you couldn't decipher anything. The wiggly lines somehow made it more visible. Uh, the uh, nodes are the D0 brains. The links tell you which modes you've kept in the system. And these expander graphs, I'll tell you what they look like. They're first of all, statistically homogeneous. They're everywhere pretty much the same. They're not perfectly homogeneous because you did this by a random selection, but they're statistically homogeneous. And if you start any place at any point and work outward, whoops, excuse me, what you will see is a tree graph. Start at any point and work outward. And on the average, you will see a tree graph, a growing tree graph, which grows exponentially. That's true starting anywhere, although it's only easy to draw starting at one point. And that tells you that the number of nodes increases exponentially, sorry, yes, the number of nodes increases exponentially with the distance away from a given node. And it tells you that the diameter of the, uh, until that of course stops, you only have a finite number in. Um, I think it stops when you've covered about half the nodes. When you've covered about half the nodes, it stops growing. Uh, the diameter of the graph, meaning the largest separation between any pair of points grows like logarithm of n. That logarithm of n is important. First of all, it would tell you that the diffusion time on this graph, you start something happening somewhere and it diffuses outward, takes a time of order log n, not into a power as would be the case for a non-random degree three graph. Diffusion time is log n. It's also true that quantum systems on expander graphs, while the expander graphs are vastly sparser then all to all couplings, they are much sparser. They are still fast scramblers. I refer to a paper by uh, Sue, Sue, Susskind, and Swingle uh, studying fast scramblers on these kind of graphs. And furthermore, expanders are the sparsest fast scramblers. If you make the graph any sparser, in other words, if you make the probability any larger to eliminate edges, you will destroy the fast scrambling property. So that's the situation. Now you look at things, you have d equals four, d equals five, d equals six, up to d equals infinity. d equals infinity is where we're getting these expander graphs. d equals four, we have all to all couplings and everywhere is in between, they're all fast scramblers. If we went past p equals one, the fast scrambling would disappear. So it seems this is by way of an existence proof, if you like, that the weakening connectivity implied by the diminishing string freezing effect is consistent with fast scrambling. I was worried about that. I thought, uh, I, I thought 
the fast scrambling would be destroyed. Okay, I uh, let's see. Um, I've gone on a long time, longer than I thought I would. All right, the yeah. Um, so supposing I give you a uh, a fast scrambling quantum system, it could be. Uh, and it has some, some manifest symmetry, some obvious symmetries, um, but uh, nothing very sophisticated. <clears throat> how can I tell that, <clears throat> excuse me, how can I tell that that quantum system represents the sitter space and not something else? I mean, the systems I've described are very similar to the same systems that I might try to use to describe black holes. How can I tell if it's the sitter space or something else? And I think the answer is the symmetry of the system, the full symmetry of the system, in particular, the symmetries which relate different static patches. Here again, this two-dimensional the sitter space, it has a pair of static patches, green and, and uh, pink. There are symmetry transformations of the, the sitter space which move the static patches and take them to new static patches. Those symmetries are a non-compact uh, OD1 group of some sort. And um, we might ask, is that symmetry realized by the, by the system that I've constructed? If it is, then it has a chance of being the sitter space. If it's not, well, then it's something else. So the question that I wanna raise then is what do we know about the possibility of being able to implement the symmetries which take us between one static patch and another static patch, or between one pair of static patches and another pair of static patches? Notice that the endpoint of this static patch over here, where is it? Over here is behind, is in the, um, is behind the horizon, so to speak, of the original pair of static patches. So we're moving things around, taking things from inside the horizon to outside the horizon. And these are symmetries. These are not symmetries that we would expect for any kind of black hole system. They're new symmetries that the sitter space has to have. So I would say we recognize the sitter space if the system uh, implements the symmetry group. Well, um, all right. I, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to stop here. What I'm going to tell you is number one, that it is impossible to to uh, to represent the symmetry group. Uh, there's a no-go theorem about it. The no-go theorem is an old no-go theorem from many years ago. But that old no-go theorem also applies to ADS2, and it applies equally well to a system that we've been studying for a number of years now, namely, let's see, where is it? In SYKJT ADS2 system, the same kind of non... Uh, and there we've learned, what, we, what we've learned is that the symmetry can at best be approximate, but I think it's also true that that symmetry can be, I don't know if it can be exact. One, can the SL2 symmetry of JT gravity be exact on, in the ensemble average sense? But what I think I would suggest is that perhaps the logic of the breaking of the symmetries of the sitter space is similar to the logic of the breaking of the symmetries of uh, the ADS2 space, and that the upshot, it's just a suggestion, is that the sitter space is really realized as an ensemble average rather than uh, for individual exact versions of it. But uh, I think I've gone on long enough now. I've certainly gone on long enough for me. Hmm. I've reached an age now where I can't go for more than an hour without getting uh, tired. <laughs>